Uh, really, I don't even know why I'm up here because in this crowd, uh, there's really no introduction needed uh, for Ken. Um, but I wanted to at least uh, welcome Ken back to Columbus. Uh, really excited to hear about uh, his the new book that he's worked on and something that's near and dear to my heart, which is continuous delivery and trying to really break down how you get software out and shippable uh, in a 30-day time frame, as well as just making sure that all the quality, because too many people will say that you can't do that, this project's too big, the software can't do that, and so I think Ken has some pretty strong opinions in that manner, which I know he'll discuss today. So let's please give a very warm welcome to uh, Ken Schwaber. Is this working? Yes. Sounds like it's working. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi. I'm okay so far. Like the guy falling off the Empire State Building. Is this clear? Pretty good? Okay, so I wanted this clear because there's a lot of people say, well, what does Scrum feel like? And this Mark Twain quote was the best description I'd ever seen. A lot of torn up arm. When Jeff Sutherland and I were formulating Scrum, uh, both of us did a lot of research into first principles, making sure we understood why it would work. Uh, we didn't just want to pull together another um, process or, or methodology that was based on whim. Of course, there was whim. But we wanted to see why this worked. Um, so I remember I, I had gone to DuPont um, Advanced Research Facility, and they were, led me through theory and ideas about um, definitive and prescribed prescriptive approaches versus empirical approaches. And they said, but you know, all that's really interesting, but it doesn't matter. The real test of whether you're using the right process or not, strangely enough, is does it work? He said, for instance, you seem to be struggling a lot with the approach you're using now, um, the approach that we just talked to you about. We, the way you can tell if it's an appropriate one is you'll have better results. They said, if you don't, it's probably the wrong approach, you know, whatever. But test it, see if it works better statistically. So this year, um, at the end of last year, actually, Standish Group, um, a group that puts out the chaos report every year, which assesses and, and surveys and assesses the um, pro IT projects in the United States. And every year they come out with a report, the chaos report, and it's uh, pretty critical of the IT um, profession and lays out all of the dimensions in which we uh, could improve. And the last three or four years they've been discussing um, agile and iterative, you know, mentioning that there's something going on. And this was the first year when they actually separated um, and reporting on um, traditional um, approach to software development waterfall from um, an agile approach. And their analysis was that if you're using a traditional approach, your chance of success is about 14%. That would mean if you were building cars that you would throw away eight cars for every one you shipped. Not a great statistic. Um, when they assessed the projects that said they were using Agile, 42% um, were successful. Still throwing away one for every other one, but it's three times more successful than ones that were using Waterfall. I think that's statistically significant. Now what's interesting here is they measured um, success. Um, they tried to make apples apples. So if you got all the requirements that you projected at the start of the project done on the date that you projected for the cost that you predicted, that was success. What they didn't um, measure was possibilities of getting done earlier, getting rid of requirements that were of low value. Um, all those things which most of us in the Agile community would consider the leading edge of the benefits of Agile. So, 41% when it's apples to apples, um, probably more significant other ways. And this was their, their quote regarding this. Um, I regret the way they worded this because it sounds 
you know, like cod liver oil or something like that. The agile process is the universal remedy. That's overkill. For software development project failure, software applications developed through the agile process have three times the success rate of the traditional waterfall method and a much lower percentage of time and cost overruns. The secret is trial and error in the delivery of the iterative process. Um, interesting that they said that. Um, certainly, it's not a universal remedy. It's a widely used approach. Now, the reason I mention this is um, this conference is the path to agility. Um, this is indicating that perhaps this is a way of moving toward agility. Uh, agility is a word that's often confused. I hear people saying, um, which agile process are you using? Uh, processes usually aren't agile, they're just, they just sit there. So the process that, that I um, expound on is Scrum. It's not by no means agile, but you can use it to be agile. So agile state of being, be able to respond to situations, take advantage of opportunities. Um, and, and in here, what I'm going to be talking about is a path from starting to use Scrum, one of the processes that are described as agile, in a continuous improvement on the path to agility. And this is just one statistic saying, by and large, most people are doing better. And that's good. And this is a, a recent um, survey by Forrester Research. Interesting, they no longer say, choose the one. They say, choose the ones. And so you'll see actually um, different processes up here, plus a bunch of best practices. And it's interesting because you'll see Scrum, you'll see XP, but you also see TDD, a practice. You'll see Test First Development, a practice. So you see um, people, what they're reporting on, what's going on. And this is very good because if we had done the same thing 10 years ago, uh, you might have seen some Scrum, a lot of XP, and you would have seen very few of these practices. So it means the software developers are getting more serious about the practices they use to build software. How many of you um, use Scrum? More or less, good. Do you, do you know that Scrum is changing? Didn't know that. Kept it secret. I guess it wouldn't matter if we changed it if we didn't tell anyone. So over the last year, um, Jeff Sutherland and I have been upgrading parts of Scrum, upgrading, changing. And I want to go over that with you. We've been posting it at our websites and making it very visible to the extent we can. But these presentations are certainly another way of doing that. And that, of course, is part of our way of continuous improvement. Um, the Scrum, as you, as you know, very, very small framework. It's an approach toward being able to build complex systems in complex environments. It uses iterative incremental techniques. It uses self-organizing cross-functional teams. That um, thing there is a book, 17, no, it's 13 pages long now, that's on scrum.org's website, and we have like 30 translations. 13 pages is not real big. So it's certainly not going to tell you a lot. It may give you some ideas and structure, but it's not going to be something that tells you, you know, how you brush your teeth in the morning. We updated it over the last year. Um, one of the first things we did, and that's, by the way, the um, picture of the first thing. Jeff and I put our picture on in signatures so that when it's imitated, copied, borrowed, they have to send our pictures out, too. So that's good. Um, one of the first things we did is it's being translated um, very widely into languages that are not very similar to English. So we tried to straighten out all the idioms, um, all of the types of wording which were particular to um, Latin languages and to um, English in particular. So you'll notice, I hope, that the wording is simpler. And that was our, our first intention. Um, people would try reading it in Russian. They're like, hmm. Didn't, didn't translate. So one of the um, things that we've done is we, when we first put out Scrum and across the first 12 or 13 years, we put in some practices in Scrum. 
So Scrum is, is just a framework, a little like a chess game is just a framework, but we put in some practices to help you figure out how to do things in there. So for instance, we, we put in ideas about the best way to formulate a sprint backlog, how to decompose it, tasks might be a great idea. We put in things which um, told you how to do things rather than just the framework itself. And we did that on purpose because we wanted, um, it's like training wheels, you know, an approach that might make sense for people doing it. What's happened over the last 10 years is there have been many other equally good, sometimes even better, um, practices that have arisen. And um, we thought we wanted to open Scrum up to that rather than it being seen as if you don't use this practice, you're not using Scrum. So one of the things that we're, we're endeavoring to do is remove um, practices bit by bit from Scrum as there are significantly good alternatives, either published or in places where we can point to that are in you know, practice libraries. So we've been pulling out practices, good. And so some of the practices we've, where there are good alternatives is the sprint backlog composition. Is it tasks? Maybe, maybe not. Um, the product backlog decomposition. How do we decompose it? What is it decomposed into? Many alternatives. Sprint burn down to track progress. Huh, what's a burn in? What's a stochastic modeling? What's a burn up? So many, many, again, good other practices. Initial content of the sprint backlog. What does it consist of? The initial high level tasks or does it, con so many alternatives. And what we want to do is open this up and leave Scrum as a framework and many good practices that would and could be used. Now this doesn't obviate the practices that we had in Scrum. Certainly feel free to use those, but it means that they're wide open for good alternatives. And so another one that comes in is the daily Scrum flow. We're certainly looking at that. So for instance, the um, sprint, and I'm gonna look at this because I can, Lose my neck doing this. The um, sprint backlog, the practice of it. Normally, you would um, select some product backlog items for during the sprint planning meeting, and you would immediately start decomposing them into tasks. That would be a practice that was there. And this is saying, oh, you don't have to decompose them into tasks. What we started seeing was any number of companies you'd have them come into the, the daily scrum, and when people said, well, I did this task and I did that task, it tended to isolate rather than bind them into a team. And we found that the people that were decomposing their product backlog items into smaller product backlog items, smaller stories, um, you would have two or three people working on the same decomposed story, and they would talk about what they, as a group, were working on, and it tended to create more teamwork, sometimes. So what we're trying to do is leave that form of decomposition totally up to the team. Then what we also want to do is to give a sound point for that decomposition is when you select some product backlog items for the sprint, those are pulled from the product backlog and become the formation point for the sprint backlog. So after that, it's a decomposition of them into um, what's gonna be done in the sprint. So most appropriate technique. Um, the other technique, which is of course becoming very, very widely used, is decomposing product backlog items to further and further granular um, acceptance criteria. So product backlog, selected product backlog, decomposition of that product backlog, just the idea. Thought I'd show that to you so you saw that it worked in PowerPoint. Um, the next is the, the sprint burn down chart. Pretty good approach. Um, it certainly is a good way of telling uh, how much work uh, remains. It, tells, it may tell you a trend line toward completion. Uh, it may tell you how much work you started with and how that's going up and down. So it can tell you many things. Um, those of you that are using Kanban um, during, during your sprint don't necessarily have a burn down. Is that bad? Is that good? Don't know. If you're using a burn up, is that good or bad? Uh, and so the questions um, weren't necessarily about 
whether you had a burn down or burn up or Kanban or not, um, is that the team, the, the development team, is always aware of the remaining work that they had to complete by the end of the sprint and that they had an active awareness and plan for how they intended to turn that into something that they had forecast they would deliver. So we want proof of their self-organization and if they're doing the planning. Burn down is one good technique, many other good techniques. Uh, what I found always is a very useful question for any team is, especially after the daily scrum, is very, very interesting. Thank you for the information. So you guys seem to be doing very well. However, I do not believe that you know what you're doing and you know how you're going to deliver what you said you would do. Show me. And if they can't burn up, burn down, whatever, they literally don't know what they're doing. And that's a point where you stop the sprint and start working through coaching about how to work together. So this says sprint burn down chart, great technique, not the only one you have to use. Release planning. Those of you that follow all the groups, um, these, these are almost like religious wars. <laughs> For instance, did you know that a sprint, at the end of it, has a release? So release planning is only one sprint long, which implies then that you don't have to plan for any further into the future. Many religious discussions about that. Um, curious, not very useful. So many ways of planning a release, many ways of organizing a release, many ways of tying it back to roadmaps and all those things, many approaches to it. We used to have one within um, Scrum, we pulled it out. However you organize your sprints into something that can be released that has the highest value, totally up to you. If your product owner doesn't have a technique for doing that, it'll become transparent pretty quickly. Wow. So these are more changes. And the product backlog. Prioritize product backlog. Very clear. This one is more valuable than that one. It's more valuable than that one. It could be by priority, value, criticality, um, risk, many things. And we found many product owners were pretty upset by that because they did not think of product backlog items when they've been decomposed for, for upcoming sprints as, as granular units. They saw them as, we are going to accomplish this goal within this user scenario, this goal within this workflow by delivering these four or five things. No one or two of them is really high priority, but as a group, they are really high priority. So that was very, um, I was going to resist that until someone pointed me to the dictionary, and when you look up ordered, prioritization is one form of ordering. So the word now is you have to have the product backlog ordered in such a way that the product owner fulfills their primary purpose, which is optimizing the delivery of value. This is a little like bringing your car and having things you know, brushed up and the oil changed. Interesting changes. Um, some changes in wording. Um, some wording, for instance, in, this, in the way we use Scrum, seemingly innocent, seemingly vanilla, and yet it, it invoked or, or, or um, brought about um, prior habits or ways of thinking which caused um, dysfunction within the Scrum process. So we um, are removing them, some of them sadly, some of them not so sadly. Um, the first one of them is um, that we have um, the development team used to be the team, right? So you had the product owner, the Scrum Master, the team. Well, that was so confusing, hard to believe. Are you talking about the Scrum team or the team team? Well, which one has the developers? Oh, that's the team team, but they have the Scrum, and you got really wrapped up. So we, I tried three years ago making it the Scrum Master, the product owner, and the developers. And that was when my tires were slashed, house was firebombed. It turned out that programmers think they're the only people who are developers and I had offended all of them. And so we now are sneaking up on doing that again by calling it the product owner, the scrum master, and the development team. So change of wording, hopefully will clarify something. Um, another one was the chickens and the pigs. Very, very good way, I thought, of 
distinguishing between people who were thoroughly engaged in doing the work and didn't need to be interrupted, and the people who were observing but actually didn't have any skin in the game. Um, some people were offended, particularly chickens, but, you know, there it is. And another one is commit to forecast. So this was weird. I, w I was in many, many, too many, um, and reported back sprint reviews, and the product owner, stakeholders are sitting there saying, you committed that you would do that, and I counted on it. I'm like, what? Part of the basis of Scrum is that you can't commit. You can commit to do your best, to put in your best effort, to do quality work, all those things, but the idea is that there's enough complexity that who knows what's going to happen. And the way you find out what's going to happen is you wait till the end of a very short sprint and then you see. So a way of controlling risk is not to seek certainty, but instead to shorten your sprint to a time where the risk is acceptable. But the habit of still wanting certainty persisted. And they would hold people by the nails and hang them from rafters and say, you committed. So we changed the word. Sadly, it's now forecast. Sounds weak and wimpy, right? Well, what do you mean you forecast? Well, that's what we said. We forecast. That means given our best knowledge about what's likely to happen in the future, given how we just saw a storm system move through here in the past, this is our best idea, guess, forecast of what's likely to happen. Um, this is a weak word. It's meant to emphasize the improbability of knowing for sure and help all the people that want certainty instead see that certainty comes from seeing what really happens at the end of a short sprint. So forecast. And this is how we make this more clear. Um, you never count on this. Have you ever seen a weatherman held accountable for a bad forecast? <laughs> yeah, me neither. So commitments mean, again, that we're looking at a specific quality. We're going to commit, commit to doing shared um, work. We're going to help each other. Professionalism of the members of the team are going to help and remembering empiricism. So that's what we're committing to do. That's a way of doing work. But of course, we can't guarantee the future. If we could, we wouldn't be software developers. We'd be, what, new hedge fund traders or something like that? Yeah. So this is the other one. Um, product owner team and the Scrum Master is now product owner development team and the Scrum Master. Five plus or minus three. Yeah. Yes? There was a recent change. <laughs> Six plus or minus three. Thank you, David. And you know, people who have had their feet tattooed. <laughs> so, so sorry about that. <laughs> and, and for those of you that are older, I've heard Medicare does not cover removal. You're on your own. Um, these are things that we're working on this year. Um, just some, some issues. I don't know how many of you have seen the, the um, vitriolic discussion, not conversations, arguments um, in, in the discussion boards about velocity. The ability to, to make sure you know, that our velocity gets more stable, that we can actually predict and project our velocity and, and that it's bad and it's wrong if it you know, shudders and does something wrong. Now, if you have a team that's been together for a while, knows their um, technology, knows their domain very well, your standard deviation in your velocity usually is relatively low. But you can go into a sprint, open up the software you're working on, and receive a surprise you'd never seen before. That doesn't mean you're bad or good. It just means that's why we say it's complex work. So we're having a, a real struggle with the word velocity. It wasn't ever part of the original Scrum. It was just something that if you take and create a burn down chart, there's a trend line, which you could call a velocity, which unfortunately you could then predict and think you could see into the future. So we're, we're struggling with the word velocity of how to not make, how to get people off wasting time trying to use velocity to be a predictor and how to stop them from aggravating us because it's not a perfect predictor. 
Um, so velocity is certainly a big issue. The other one, um, I don't know if you've seen this, but it's a parallel set of discussions. It's about capacity. And uh, do any of you use TFS or Visual Studio 2010? Did you know that if you're a manager, even though you're not in the Scrum team, you can look into the statistics in TFS and you can see unused capacity? Like three hours here, seven hours there. And that could mean, what's the word? Slack. Now, those of you who read Tom DeMarco's book on Slack, by the way, he was older than your father, but his good book talks about, wow, that's when your mind idles and thinks about other things. But this person you know, was writing all these things, was talking about Slack as an opportunity to get those people who weren't really percent pulling their weight. If um, I was talking about machine, I could see when it was on, when it was off. And when it was off, I could call that slack or unused. Um, however, the, the issue that we run into with that is if you have a mind, when, what is its capacity? Is its capacity in the morning when you're fresh, just had a cup of coffee, and you have 110 IQ higher than when you're tired and it's later in the day and you're really angry at someone? How do you measure the capacity, an unused capacity, of a mind, which is the way we build software? Our fingers you know, just represent what we do with our mind. So this whole thrust either toward improving our ability to see velocity or detect unused capacity is all of that thinking from our days of waterfall, um, which we've now seen does not work nearly as well, and people trying to reassert that to create certainty. Now, I would love certainty. I would love certainty that I woke up in the morning I'd know what was going to happen. I would love certainty that everything was always going to work the way I knew it. Um, it is not the mark of a mature person to spend their life seeking certainty. We live in an uncertain world. The mark of a mature person is the ability to respond to what they find is really happening, or I think so. Is that true in Ohio? <laughs> yeah, OK. So uh, that's another issue that we have. Um, these are the last things that are top of my mind that we're working on. Um, one of them is the idea about the scrum goal, sprint, sprint goal. When you formulate um, in the sprint planning meeting what's going to be done in the upcoming sprint, most product owners have a roadmap that they are working toward. And they have a number of releases they're delivering toward, you know, toward achieving that roadmap. And if you look at the sprints within a release as sub-goals, those are accomplishing things that move you toward the purpose or the, of the release. Um, we often don't want to have the idea of a goal or the purpose of a sprint to be do seven product backlog items. OK, we'll do one, then we'll do another one, then we'll do another one. Um, it tends to be less efficient. What we try to do is get people thinking about a goal, something that they can deliver to a customer as a unified piece of work, something in the system that they can change, remediate, make better, and that these product backlog items add up to doing that. So we're starting to, again, reemphasize. It's always been there, but never really very much at the front, the idea of a goal. Yeah, that's a practice. We'll probably remove it in three years, but right now, there it is. Ready PB product backlog items is another. The idea that somehow you have to do work prior to a sprint planning meeting to make sure that the product backlog items that are going to be most discussed by your product owner, any one of them can be done within the upcoming sprint. So at least they can select the most, the highest ordered one. And preferably for ways of being able to change work back and forth, that you can select maybe three to seven of them and they accumulate into a goal. So these, the thought is ready product backlog items or actionable product backlog items. This is again, a best practice. So you see, you know, we give and we take. <laughs> Who'd have guessed? Back and forth. And, and then the other part is the sprint planning meeting. Those of you that do um, a concept or practice called grooming of your product backlog item, product backlog, find that the product backlog is in good shape coming into the sprint planning meeting. 
and you, if you're a single team, may no, need no more than 15 minutes to select what you think you're going to do for the upcoming sprint. The way Scrum is stated, it's equal parts for selecting what you're going to do and then another part of how you're going to do it. And this just says, there's the period of the sprint planning meeting. You have to do what and how and come out of it with a sprint um, backlog, how you do it and what time you spend within it, totally up to the circumstances. So that'll probably be pulled out also. I want to, um, to work with you or talk with you about this because it talks about directions we're going, why we're going those directions. It also talks about um, some issues we're having with, with some of the words in Scrum consistently um, being misapplied to try to make it into a predictive technique. Um, habits die very hard. Almost every, um, I hope you won't do this, but every time I talk with a group of people of more than seven or eight people, a question they ask is, hey, how can we sell Scrum to our management? And I've always been baffled by that because you know, this is you going to your managers and saying, would you like to build software more quickly with higher quality, greater value, um, with less risk and more predictability? And what I found is the reason why that doesn't work is our business managers don't trust us. Apparently, we've come to them many times and said the same thing. Usually, it's attached to a $30 million purchase of like RUP or, or some sort of tooling and it doesn't make things better. So when we say that, um, a fair amount of disbelief. Jeff and I um, wrote this book over the last year. It's the first thing we've written together since the initial Scrum paper at Uppsala in 95. And it's Software in 30 Days is the book. Um, it is intended for a business manager. It is intended for you to put it on a business manager or even a top IT or dev manager's desk and say, might be interested in reading this. Now, one of the thoughts that we didn't make into the internationalized edition was the idea that um, every person, every manager, every business has certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and software in at least 30 days or less. That's their right. And many of them don't think this is, is their right. They think this is like a magical state. So this book is intended to be given to that manager. And it starts out and talks about um, general problems that people might have building software, um, gives some examples. Um, one is um, parametric technology, another is the FBI, about companies that have you know, done better and how they've done better. And basically, it leaves a message. It says there is an approach out there for building software. It's worldwide. Many, many companies are using it. And these companies may include your competitors. And they're being very successful in building their software at a high, reasonably high quality in 30 days or less. So this is not you know, an unusual or freakish thing. This is something that you can go down to your development organization and ask them to do. And if they can't do it, this either means that they need training or you need a new development organization. OK, so you asked for it. Here it is, right? We're, we've loaded them for bear. And they're going to view this now as a reasonable thing to expect, which it is. And this book talks about why, how, what they can do to do it. Um, it goes through. Um, the last, I think it's like third of the book, it goes through a number of approaches that they can take. One is just trying it themselves to see what it feels like if they can pull together a bunch of developers. And this talks about you know, an app that an insurance company is trying to build um, and how effective they are. The second approach that we take them to is an idea called PRN. Do any of you take um, aspirin? Sure. Um, remember, it's PRN, Pronata take as needed. So this comes from our approach with Fidelity Investments. Fidelity is truly one of the most political, um, opaque organizations in the face of the earth. However, sometimes they have desperate systems needs, and they will bring Scrum in, use it to solve that need, then throw it out as soon as they can before it exposes anymore. And so that's using it you know, effectively pro nada. That's fine. 
Um, the third one that we're recommending uh, goes back to, um, a, it's not really a joke, it's just a, an insight. On ships, they use very, very thick cable to hold the ship to the pier. And it might be called a hawser if it's made of sisal. And there's a, a man hauling a huge, huge um, hawser up a serpentine narrow mountain road and runs into another guy who says, hey, you know, why are you hauling that blah, 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 blah up this road? And the guy said, I got tired of pushing it. Nothing is harder when you're trying to use Scrum within an organization to become agile than to convince people who could care less, who are naysayers, who say yes, but, who could, don't want to do it, who make their living being skeptics and yeah, but people. I mean, it's hard enough for the people that are thoroughly interested and really care and want to do better um, to achieve this sort of, of change and improvement. And this says, don't bother with the others. Set up a parallel environment, either in a product company or an IT organization, and staff it, equip it, tool it, um, proceduralize it, standardize it, so that this is a place where you can build quality software in less than 30 days. And it's even got training programs and ways of helping the people do it. And anyone who wants to build software in this way over there can. They can even live there as a department or as a project forever if they wish. And so this is setting up an alternative environment and hopefully by doing this, establishing the profound differences between one way and the other and draining the swamp of the people who don't want to do this and could care less. So this is, yes, a coward's way out, but there you have it. It works. The um, next way is something that I think almost um, everyone who's done what they call an enterprise transition has experienced. Um, Jeff has done many, I've done many, and we are all deeply um, appreciative and proud of those situations. So we have uh, companies like Intuit and, and many others that have adopted Scrum, continuous improvement, become great places to work. And then their senior managers, the leaders, the people who made this happen, get promoted. You know, people say, wow, you really make things happen. Let's hire you away. The organization sinks back, not as bad as they were before, but they lose that thirst for excellence. Turns out that this was not an organizational change. It was a way of doing business imposed by those managers on the current culture and was able to persist as long as those managers were there making it happen. And that's good. It only takes about two years to do this, to, to get them up to speed like this. It's just not a persistent change. The next one is, refers to a profound and permanent change in the organization, a change in the organization's culture. And we, we've um, consulted with John Cotter at Harvard Business School, who's um, expert in change within an organization. And this includes things like making sure there's a permanent management community that's dedicated to change, communicating up and down the organization consistently, because one of the things that kills us is rumors. Another thing is taking and grooming and promoting and hiring people to think this is the right way to do work throughout the management ranks. So when the top level leaves, it is not a big deal. This is the way the organization thinks. And the last part is what they call anchoring, going through and ruthlessly finding everything that supports individual performance, behavior, um, opacity, all those other things which uh, make agility difficult to achieve, and changing them. Um, this is not a two-year effort. This is a six-year effort. And John's assessment is about 30% of the efforts that take this on um, succeed. And so he's not just looking at agility, he's also looking at lean, TQM, Six Sigma, all those other things, and, and his and um, his peer success rate with that. Many of us can do the first bunch of them. Um, probably it's a whole different skill set to do the last one of them. So those are the approaches that, that we came up with um, for taking a manager and saying, this, these approaches may help you achieve this. Now I mentioned before Scrum chess, right? You go into a um, game store, you buy a chess board, you open it up, 
and you pull out the chess guide of instructions. It's pretty small. It's about as small as, as scrums. And the moment you open it up and read it, you probably can play chess. Not very well. You probably will um, get clobbered in your first game, even to an amateur. And the only thing that will help you is studying a lot of uh, books about grand chess strategies, games, playing with people that you can find, and well, what's the word? Continuously improving, continuously getting better. And you get as better or as good as you have the determination and vision to become. So we're, we're talking about Scrum that same way. So this is a model of, of what we had in that book, um, Software in 30 Days, and it talks about um, starting with just Scrum, just like you start with just chess. You can move the pieces the right way. You have a product owner. Product owner may also be the scrum master in the dev team, but you have a product owner. So are you doing the basics? And then we continually move up the ladder, just like in chess. Um, first of all, gaining productivity, gaining quality, um, being able to, to gain. Can you see that better than I can? Oh, the ability to gain ROI, then value, and last, being able to have a persistent organization that um, is continuously improving, and that's the way they do business. So these are a bunch of steps that we've laid out, and what we're doing is instantiating now with the practices that you would use to um, go from one level to another, ways of doing checklists to see if you're at that point, and perhaps even um, assessments and or metrics that you should be achieving if you've done that work. And there are four threads um, that drive this continuous improvement. Um, one is, um, and they're, they're each management initiatives. One is a persistent, focused effort to increase value. The other is the same thing, to increase the productivity. The other is to increase the quality. And the last is to create change that's needed to support all this. I would um, challenge you to find in any organization a management group or even a manager who is right now accountable for this to happen and has metrics that show their increase or decrease in doing their work and is rewarded accordingly. This is not part of most management structures. And we, what we find are these are the four threads that we have to drive in order to get this continuous improvement of going up to productivity, quality, ROI, value, um, and persistent change. That's interesting, some, some neat words. This is a picture of Scrum in an enterprise when you bring it in. Um, this org chart may look familiar to you. It is the traditional um, IT or even uh, a product company's organization chart. So you have product managers, and you have dev managers, and you have functional managers. Um, functional managers are always fun because, like, I'm in charge of quality. Hmm. What does that mean? Oh, I have people that test to see if there is quality. That's not being in charge of there being quality. That's seeing if there is quality. Very different. So this is um, a scrum team or a bunch of scrum teams in a regular organization, hierarchical organization. Um, it is an odd duck. It does not fit. And it causes pandemonium amongst middle management ranks because they go home and they talk to their wife or husband and say, hey, you know, we're bringing something called Scrum in and your husband or wife says, okay, what's that do to our kids' ability to go to college? Are you going to get your promotion? Are you going to get your raise? What are you going to be judged on? And you sit there looking very dumbstruck because you don't know. And my goodness, if I were a manager in that situation, I would resist this every which way I could. So what we've tried to do is lay out a model um, of what an organization that is not structured as though we're a factory and we're not resources and we have capacities might look like. And so this, this would be an organization that would be structured along, along these walls. You would have people who would be responsible for developing software in Scrum. That would be the development team. You would be people who would be responsible for creating value, and that would be around the product owner. 
you'd have people who would be responsible for increasing productivity and creativity. That would rotate around the Scrum Master. You'd have people who would be responsible for creating quality. Huh, that's interesting. So this takes and says quality is a proactive thing. If we have within our organization the definition of done, well, that's going to help with quality. If we have automated test harnesses, if we have continuous build, if we have continuous test, if we have people learning test-first development, TDD, if we have them learning new approaches, and these become the standards, guidelines, conventions that we use here, as well as, let's say, some frameworks that are in place, wow, we're probably going to build higher quality products. So it doesn't say we check and see if it's high quality, and instead take a very active driving role toward creating quality products. And the last one is change. My goodness, we're talking about change here. Wouldn't it be nice to have a small group that is accountable for as we run into issues and problems for formulating and creating that change? So these would be, if I were formulating um, an organization such as in software in 30 days, um, that would be replacing a current organization and giving current people a place to work and call home, these would be the homes that I would have for them. And each one of these homes would, have, would be using Scrum. They would be, have their own product backlog. They would have sprints. They would have clear accountability to have metrics that they would measure for and they would, they would have to improve. Tremendous opportunity there for things to become suboptimal. So if you really, really push for productivity, you could drop quality, et cetera, et cetera. So all these have to report up to an overall arching goal of something, software or product that meets the organizational vision. Now what this does for you is if you have, um, let's say this is the current organization and you have this as a target organization, um, wow, people could just start moving over. And isn't it simple? If you have animation in PowerPoint, it looks really simple. I just love it. So you see um, a lot of the managers going up into the change area because they are the ones with some of the authority. They're some of the ones who know how to work the organization, making change happen. You see a lot of the um, functional managers going to the value area as well as the product managers because they're the ones who understand how to formulate um, the work that's going to be done to optimize value. You see a lot of the um, other, the dev managers going into the productivity area where we're looking at scrum masters. We're also talking then about people who are maybe the best engineers, the best developers, the most um, skilled and insightful um, software professionals we have going into the quality area where they may be laying out these standards and formats and guidelines that the rest of us use. And so you see them shifting over, oh, that goes to quality. Where will usability, oh, usability, quality, DBA, quality infrastructure. That would go to productivity, QA. And wow, then that last project goes over there. And all of these hierarchical reporting relationships, guess what happens to them? I love this. They disappear. It's great. And all these groups use Scrum. So this is our model um, about how an organization can effectively operate to continuously improve, to go through the path to agility. And what we're trying to do is actually lay it out so that um, that continuous improvement, zero plus one plus two plus three, becomes almost a um, mental model for people who want this to happen. This is certainly a different mental model than people who call, for, for instance, me up now and say, we really want to become agile. Can you come in and train us for two days? And I'm kind of left saying, uh, er, um, <laughs> not going to do it. Are any of you, um, <laughs> this is a tainted question, are any of you familiar with the FBI? Have they pounded on your door lately? Um, <laughs> even asking about your neighbors? Okay, so I don't know if you're aware of this, but your chance of not being apprehended if you rob a bank is pretty good because for every crime there is a case file. And 
there isn't a lot of ability to correlate that information and spot trends. Most of that is anecdotal or they pass information back and forth, but there's no way of spotting trends across time in cases. So they started, the FBI, our favorite place, started back in 2000, um, I think it was one, a project um, which was going to automate this. And in 2005, of course, all efforts were canceled. It was scrapped at a cost of $170 million. Um, Robert Mueller is the um, director of the FBI. He has to appear in front of Congress every six months and report on all of his significant programs. If his lips get tighter, he's going to implode. <laughs> not, not a happy thing to do when you just blew $170 million. So he's talking about, well, maybe you know, we could take a slightly different approach. And, but yeah, here it is, the different approach. I know, we'll give it a different name. We'll call it Sentinel. So that sounds like it's worth funding. So in 2006, they started another initiative to replace the failed one called Sentinel. They awarded the contract to Lockheed Martin using the standard waterfall, I think it was IDF 2167 approach. Um, and they won this, this contract. They started, and it was a four-phase approach that was supposed to be done in 2011. Four phases, um, it was going to cost 500 and some million dollars, and it was going to take six years. In 2010, you see that um, Robert has turned to God on this one. Hmm. Um, 2010, God was not listening to the director of the FBI. Um, only 1.5 phases were done their year from completion, and they've spent $421 million. The phases that they've shipped out, the FBI um, administrators and agents do not like using They continue with the old techniques. Um, and um, they brought in MITRE, a DOD contracting company, who estimated that it was going to take another six years, another $351 million to actually finish it using the same approach. Do you remember Lehman Brothers? Right? Well, just about this time, they went belly up, and their CIO and CTO suddenly were the out work. And Robert found them and brought them in to take over the Sentinel project. And the first thing they did is they were very familiar with Scrum and Lean, is they decided they were going to use Scrum and Lean. They worked with the auditors on how to do this, and um, they restarted the project. In one year, the project was completely done for $30 million. They dropped the staff from 400 people to 40 people, resituated it into the basement of the Hoover Building in Washington, D.C., and used Scrum. And the CTO was down there. They brought in a couple of special agents who also knew how to code and were skilled at cybersecurity. And they did it in one year. $30 million. Went to roll it out, they've got to rechange the hardware, but they're in process of rolling it out now. I'm talking to this guy, Jeff Jefferson, about um, how this happened, and I noticed when I'm talking to him, he didn't once mention himself. He kept talking about the guys and what they did and how it worked and the teams, and um, no credit to himself, he's talking about them. And he said, I just was, you know, facilitating, I was helping them, and, you know, I was pulling out the impediments and blocking for them. He said, my biggest fear is that this is going to become a success story through, known throughout Washington, D.C., and everyone's going to think that this is because of Scrum. He said, Scrum was a facilitator. This was due to our hard work. The reason I mentioned this story to you is, one, it's significant, but it's also in the public record. If you go to the Department of Justice website and look under the Inspector General's reports, they report on this since 2001, every six months, in detail, with numbers, with opinions, and um, people who say, hey, is this going to be for us? You know, well, I think so. You say, well, let's look at what happened here. So I really like that. Now, last but not least, Go. Yep. It's almost there. Um, we are going to, we brought with us, I don't know if you know how heavy books are. Very heavy. We brought with us 40 copies of this book. 
and um, I'll sign the 40 and give them to the first 40 people who are in line. Free. Keyword, free. And we're going to do that um, in the tents right outside the door where you come in. Um, we could not figure a more intelligent way of doing this, so um, it's going to be a British queue um, with mad dogs enforcing it. And if you're amongst the first 40 in line, great. If you are the 41st person in line, you try sneaking in um, amongst the others. Um, where's Bart? Bart Murphy has one of those casers. That's good. <laughs> Excellent. Good. So I hope that helped update what's going on, where we are, what we're trying to do. Um, are there any questions that I can entertain? Yes. Can you stand up and? Uh, can you share your thoughts about Kanban? Kanban. Which types of thoughts? My good thoughts or my can't be said in public thoughts? <laughs> it's prospects for uh, enhancing software engineering. Yes. Um, I actually have a model of Kanban that I teach people to use within a sprint as training wheels with the swim lanes teaching them how to set up the acceptance test, decompose the tests into design of tests of code of all that, and then do their individual parts and then pull it back together. And so I'm using it as a way of training them um, of you know, the traditional swim lanes. Usually it's you know, not ready, you mean prepped, done, QA. This is a way of just giving them a sense of another way. So I like it that way for, for helping people understand things. Um, Kanban is one of the lean techniques. And so it's, it's a very, very good technique if more things are known than not known. So it doesn't give you a way of controlling risk in uncertain environments. It doesn't give you a way of creating predictability. Um, it actually tries to optimize events across what's happening, and constantly minimize the queues and working the queues. All that is laudable um, if you have an environment which you can bring towards certainty rather than accepting that it's an uncertain environment. Uh, my concern is, remember at the very start when we started talking, I said, um, the guys at DuPont Advanced Research said, you can tell if you're using the right process by the success rate or the yield rate. So we're getting a pretty good yield rate off Scrum from an empirical approach, which is different than a lean approach. Um, I'm interested in seeing for those that kind of change Scrum so it's more a Kanban technique overall if they are able to sustain the same high yields. I suspect not because intellectually it's different in terms of the amount of stuff you don't know. I think that's it. Oh, you have a question? Yeah, it's just a quick, it's just a quick question. So by taking the language of chickens versus pigs out of the uh, out of Scrum, yeah. does that mean that you actually don't believe that there are chickens versus pigs, or you just took it out to keep from offending the chickens? I, I don't even know who I was offending, but it certainly was a big deal. Um, in my heart, there's always still chickens and pigs. And I encourage you all, without prejudice, to keep that deep in your heart because chickens are still chickens, right? We know it. They know it. Thank you. Welcome. So good luck to you. I will see you around and certainly in a year. Bye.